shower. It's the first one I ever went to. Alright, we are going to talk about chapter 2, or at least part of chapter 2. I don't know if we'll wind up getting all the way through it or not. I think maybe if we don't get through it, that you're just responsible for it anyway. Mother. I reserve the right to change my mind. See my quotes up here? Well, I'm going to erase that one. <laughs> I reserve the right to change my mind. So, I really would like for us to be able to get back on schedule because okay. I don't like our schedule being screwed up. I'll do it if it's necessary, but I want to get back on track as quickly as possible. So, let's talk about chapter two. Chapter two is all about what? What's the Workforce title of the chapter? Safety and wellness. Yeah. Workforce safety and wellness. So, whose safety and wellness do we care about? Uh, yours first and then the patient. So first, you care about your own safety. So rescue or safety first. Then whose safety do we care about? Scene safety and including safety of others. Okay, so we care about your partner. Or your co-workers. Then whose safety do we care about? Then the patients. Not everybody else who's there trying the to help. Bystanders, yes. Yeah, so we care about the Leos, we care about the firefighters, we care about the other assistive personnel. Then, then we'll worry about our bystanders. And then who do we care about? The patient. Then we care about the patient. Why is the patient so far down on the list? Because you don't want to injure yourself trying to help them, and then there will be nobody to help them. Yeah, you don't want anybody else to be another patient on a scene. They become part of the problem, if not part of the solution. Yeah. Yeah, so we want to make sure everybody else is out of the way, or safe, or whatever, before we start worrying about our rescue, or our patient. Okay? What is the most important... Thing that you need to remember. When we get through all of this, rescue or safety first is the most important thing that you need to remember, right? How about when we get to patient care? I need to remember, what do you need to remember when we get to patient care? You just looked over at my quotes over there, Corey. I saw you do it. It's up there, isn't it? Yeah. Do no more harm. Why is that a big deal? You don't want to make things worse. You don't want to make things worse. Your job isn't to make things worse. That's not why you were there. Darn it. <laughs> That's a bummer. of stress, right? And you have stress in your life, whether you are a firefighter and an EMT or a paramedic or a student or a spouse or you have stress in your life all over the place. Stress in and of itself is not a bad thing. How you respond to that stress could be a bad thing. What are some of the signs that you may have too much stress. Sleeplessness. What's that? Sleeplessness. Yeah, you could have sleeplessness. I like colors. I know I've said that before. 
sleeplessness. What else? Irritability. Irritability. What else? You might turn to alcohol or drug use. Okay, you might turn to substance abuse. So we're going to go with increased substance use or abuse. What else? Depression. You could start suffering from depression. How about a change in your sexual drive? Or a change in your appetite. Or you don't or you don't do the things that you used to like to do. Yeah. You don't do the things. So just changes, unusual changes. What are some of the ways that we can adjust to our stressors. Positive releases. What's that? Like positive releases of stress, like working out and things like that. Okay, we can work out. What else can we do? Somebody. Talk to somebody. Who do you need to talk to? Any one of different people. Counselors, your priest, your partner, your partner, parents, spouse. Yeah. Talk people, to somebody. People with which you have that empathic relationship with. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a trained counselor. If you have a, a relationship with someone and you trust them, you can talk to them, right? Your priest, your spouse, whatever. Whoever you have that relationship with, that's who you can talk to. What else? You can always take better care of yourself, get a proper amount of sleep, eat right. proactive kind of approach. Okay. What else? How can you minimize your stressors? These are, are ways that we can help deal with the stressors that are given to us, but how can we minimize or remove our stressors? Time management. Time management? perfect world you can avoid the thing that stresses you but maybe not so in this career field how are you going to avoid them in this career field what can you do to avoid your stressors if you're working with somebody that stresses you out you can request a like transfer okay you can try and find a different partner shift. What else? Can you cut back on overtime? Can you change agencies, look for another job? says you should do is change your attitude about the stressor. How do you feel about that? You can do it if you want. I mean, 
just if you view something in a negative way, you can always, I mean, just start change your attitude about it, and view it in a positive way, or not let it affect you. If some way said, if you have a partner that some they do something that really bothers you, you can just change how you look at it. And can you give me an example? Um, if people keep, if say you have three fridges at your fire department and people keep getting into those fridges, you can just let it roll off your shoulders and don't really care, or you can let it eat away at you. Okay. Um, if you all, if it's bothering you and you are, you're on, you're on a shift yep. and you buy six months worth of frozen pizzas that you stick in your freezer at the station. You want to have one pizza every shift from now until May. Okay? And you keep track of those pizzas because you have a little bit of an OCD personality. And you think, okay, I ate a pizza three days ago. I ate a pizza today. I ate a pizza six days ago. I ate a pizza nine days ago. I ate a pizza 12 days ago. I should still have 20 pizzas, but I only have 15. What's the first thing that goes into your mind? Somebody took them. People are eating your food. Kill. What's that? <laughs> Who are we going to kill? Who are we going to kill? Okay. Is it possible that there's a good explanation for that? Yes. Sure. Maybe B shift had a horrible fire that they were out on for 12 hours. They didn't have time to fire up the barbecue and cook the tri-tip steak that they had planned for dinner. They had to settle for frozen pizzas that were in the freezer. Maybe that's why they put it. Maybe your best friend is on B shift. And you've told your best friend before, you can have whatever you want that's mine. Do you still want to kill him because he ate five of your pizzas? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> but are you a little bit more accepting because it's your best friend and you think, maybe my best friend ate my five pizzas? Are you going to go into B shift's fridge and you're going to take his yogurt? Mm -hmm. Maybe so. <laughs> So if you back up a step, what you're saying about changing the attitude about the stressor is that maybe you need a little more education, get a few more facts about the situation to help you overcome and look at it in a different way. You could say that, yeah. If you have a, if you have a stressor that you think you have all the facts to, like you work with someone who is, I don't know if I'm in the camera, but you work with someone who is super cranky all the time. And you think, oh, man, this guy's got such a negative attitude. Why is he always such a negative Nelly? I mean, we should just call this guy Eeyore because he's really down all the time, and I just don't like dealing with him. That's not a great attitude to have, right? No. Do we all know someone like that? Maybe instead of thinking, man, this guy's a jerk, maybe you can think, you know, he's really critical, but he's really critical of himself. You know, the problem isn't that he's critical of me. The problem isn't that he's critical of his surroundings, but he's really hard on himself. He must have a low self-esteem issue. Does that change your opinion of the person who's being cranky and angry? So even though you didn't get any more facts, other than this guy's cranky and he's obnoxious, you didn't get any more facts, but if you think about it from a different angle, you can change your attitude about his actions. It's a little more acceptable to me, maybe to you, I don't know, but it's a little more acceptable to me if someone is cranky, if I think they must have had a bad day. Um, they must have had 60 bad days in a row. <laughs> but if I can try and find something positive in what they're doing, it changes my attitude about it. Man, B-Squad ate five of my frozen pizzas, but they did damn good on that fire that they had to fight. Yeah, it sucks. Still sucks that B-Squad ate five of your pizzas. But they did good with it too, right? So if you can change your attitude about the stressor, then maybe it isn't quite so stressful anymore. says to me, be nice to everybody, because you never know what kind of a fight they're fighting, and yeah. everybody is fighting some kind of a fight. Yep. Yeah. And you don't know what it is. And unless you're very close to them, you're not going to find out. See, I believe, I believe that people are good at heart. I believe that. 
I believe that there's something good in everyone. Even, even the co-workers here that I struggle to get along with sometimes, they're good people. They don't make a ton of money to be here, you know, but they're good people. They connect with the students. They're teaching the students good things. Just because they don't connect with me doesn't mean that they're a bad person. So I can find something positive in those co-workers. I can find something positive in everyone. Sometimes it's harder than others. But I can. And that changes my attitude about them. When my husband and I are driving down the freeway and he's tailgating, I'm like, honey, you got to back up. Well, this person's going so slow. Maybe they're just trying to drive safely. You know, maybe you should just move around them. When he's going too fast, honey, you need to slow down. Well, we got to get there. <laughs> Doesn't matter if we get there at 8.55 or 8.57. You know, as long as we get there safe, we're going to be okay. That person cut me off. Maybe they're on their way to the emergency room. Maybe they didn't see you. Okay. To him, I'm belittling his emotions. <laughs> so sometimes I try to say to him, I understand how that could be frustrating. And I try to leave it at that. But in my mind, I'm going, maybe they had an emergency. And I'm trying to find an excuse, not an excuse. I'm trying to find a better way to look at their behavior. Because that changes my attitude about the stressor. If I think they're being jerks and they're cutting me off, I'm going to respond differently than if I think maybe their mom is in cardiac arrest and they're on their way to the hospital to say their last goodbyes. Does it change your attitude about it? It changes mine. Okay. One other thing that you can think about to adjust to your stressors or to help manage your stressors is you can try and find friends who are outside of emergency services. This profession try not to talk when my face is to the wall because I don't know if it's picking me up well or not. Um, but you want to find friends who are outside of EMS or emergency services because this profession is so stressful. It's so hard. You need to be with people that you can just chill about. People you're not going to talk about war stories with. You're not going to talk about the nasty fire that B-Shift was on and the six fatalities that happened in the warehouse. Because you know, if you go and hang out at a bar with the crew from B-Shift and the crew from C-Shift, you're going to start talking about work. And you never get away from work. And you never get away from it. So you need to find people who don't know EMS or who don't care about EMS. And it's important to have people on both sides of the fence. You want people who do know about your emergency services responsibilities and care about them. And you want people who don't. So that when you need downtime and you need to get away from work, you can go hang out with those friends. Because they're just as important, if not more important, than your friends in emergency services. All right. What is an infectious disease? Do we want to get into this? Let's see. Infectious and communicable diseases. Probably not. Just because you don't want to have to take chapter two quiz. <laughs> That's okay. You quoted it earlier. Yeah, she did. The medical condition caused by the growth and spread of small harmful organisms within the body. I remember those words. Yeah, I was working on my workbook. <laughs> If it's wet and it isn't yours, don't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes if it's wet and it is mine, I still don't want to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't deal with vomit. Lots of stuff that I can deal with, but I don't deal with... Do I deal with vomit? No. <laughs> I don't deal with vomit. My poor children had to clean up after themselves when they vomited. From the time they were old enough to even make an attempt at cleaning up their beds, because I did not deal with vomit. If they didn't make it to the toilet, they were cleaning it up off the floor. Usually their siblings help them, but I do not deal with vomit. I don't do well when I'm vomiting. I don't do well when other people are vomiting. I don't deal with vomit. That being said, you know, your brain kind of has a switch in it, and it switches off your normal responses when you're on, when you're responding to an emergency. 
I've dealt with vomit on scene. It's not my favorite thing to do, but I can't. Maybe because I have gloves and BSI on. You know? Probably. Okay. Well, you're also probably on the channel that you're providing that professional thing, so yes. you can't go, ooh. Yeah. You know, okay, that's yeah. unfortunate. Like Let's move finding on. a spider on scene. I can't yeah. scream, right? Because <laughs> that's super unprofessional. <clears throat> that's what I want to do, but I can't do it. All right, let's talk about, we're going to talk about infectious and communicable diseases, but we're going to start first by talking about PPE and BSI. What is PPE? Uh, personal protective equipment. Okay, what is BSI? Body substance isolation. Body substance isolation precaution. Are they the same thing? Mm, no, because no. one deals specifically with equipment, and the other one deals with practices. Okay. Any other opinions? Uh, PPE is to prevent the exposure uh, to a pathogen or hazardous material. Okay, PPE is to designed to prevent exposure to a hazardous material or a pathogen, right? Do you think that BSI is a part of PPE? Yeah, mm -hmm. they're not the same thing, but BSI is a part of PPE. What are some of the pieces of PPE? Gloves. Gloves. What are gloves, what are gloves designed to do? Keep their stuff from getting on you. Yeah, you're going to keep liquids, crap, other people's liquids Foreign from getting matter. on you. <laughs> so, we've got gloves. Masks. Masks. Gowns. Goggles. Booties. Booties. Suits. Guess what? All of these are part of BSI. What else falls into PPE? Oh, your station uniform. Okay. So your station uniform could be PPE. What else? What about your boots? Do you have steel-toed boots? Do you have boots that are going to protect your toes? Do you have bunker gear? Do you have wildland gear? All of it's designed for a different purpose, right? But it's all personal protective equipment. Turnouts? Do you wear helmets? Do you have your ashy safety vest for when you're working on the... the Highway, you probably don't because you're wearing turnouts and you've got your reflective material on your turnouts. I still have to wear Okay. All of that, all of that equipment falls into personal protective equipment without being a part of BSI. So BSI is a part of PPE, but PPE is much larger than just body substance isolation precautions. Can you think of other things that belong in PPE? Air packs? CPA. Oh. Okay. What about leather gloves? If you're doing extrication, you're not going to just wear your plastic gloves, right? Or your rubber gloves, your nitrile gloves. You're going to put on other gloves over the top of it, or wear the other gloves by themselves if you're not doing patient care. Right? What else falls into PPE? How about a really broad generalization of anything that is PPE? What's the definition for that? For what? For PPE. Really broad generalization. Anything that's going to keep you protect safe? You. Protect you. Yeah. Any equipment designed to provide protection. Okay. Pretty good generalization of PPE. Um, When we come back on Thursday, we are going to talk about glove removal, and we're going to finish Chapter 2. Uh, we will also lecture on at least Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is Communication and Documentation, I think. Yes. Nope, that's, no, that's Chapter, chapter four. 
Chapter three is medical, medical legal, legal, and ethical issues. Oh, I love that one. I love that chapter. So we're going to spend some time on chapter three. Maybe we'll get to start on chapter four. I don't know. I would like for us to be able to get caught up, but I am a firm believer in starting on time and ending on time. So we're going to make sure that we do that all the time. Any questions? Can you explain BSI? BSI is body substance isolation precautions. So that is whatever precautions you take to keep yourself from being exposed to body substances. So hand washing falls into BSI. All of these pieces of PPE fall into BSI because they keep you from being exposed to body fluids. Your infection control plan is part of BSI. Your waste disposal plan is part of BSI. Uh, your sharps disposal plan is part of BSI. Body substance isolation precautions are whatever process you use to ensure that you are not exposed to body substances. And these pieces of PPE are part of BSI. Make sense? Questions? How would you say that universal precautions play into this? The habit of wearing that PPE and using the BSI techniques on every patient, regardless of the circumstance. How would I say they play into it? I think that universal precautions are a necessary part of body substance isolation precautions. Um, that being said, I don't think that every form of body substance isolation precautions are necessary for every patient. So uh, I don't always put a gown on when I'm going to see a patient. I don't always put goggles on when I'm going to see a patient. I always wear gloves because you never know what body fluids that you're going to touch. You know, and it's really easy to transmit body fluids from hand to mouth. Um, so Somebody it's... once told me also that that, was a, that is as much to protect you, the EMT, as it does protects the patient because now you're going to handle that patient. So whatever you've been handling in the ambulance, you don't want to bring to that yeah, patient. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, and especially if you've got a cold or something like that, you may want to consider wearing a mask when you're doing patient care because you are trying to protect your patient. That's that whole patient advocacy thing that we talked about last chapter. Okay, anything else? All right, would you mind pushing the red button on the back of that?